أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ديفيو السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته In this series of talks we have been looking at ethical principles from the best of stories in the Holy Quran, the story of the great Prophet Yusuf As mentioned previously, this is the most unique chapter in the Holy Quran in terms of a story. There is no other chapter that is as long as this chapter and has a chronological story from its beginning until its very end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed within this story many a sign for those who reflect. From between the relationship of Yaqub and his sons Yusuf and Benjamin and the rest of the brothers to the way in which the brothers themselves treat Yusuf and treat one another. The story of course unfolds and there's a lot more that comes to light with regards to how Yusuf is then sold as a slave, how he ends up in the prison and finally how Allah plans it such that he becomes the head of the treasury. Before we continue where we've left off in this story, I want to remind us about a few different ahadith with regards to the greatness of the Holy Quran. This book that Allah has blessed us with, the book which was revealed in this very month on the most blessed night, the book that is a guidance, a form of healing for the hearts for those who believe in it. In the first hadith, the Holy Prophet peace be upon him says that if you yearn for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then listen to the Quran. For well, those are his words. If you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you naturally yearn for him. When you yearn for someone, you yearn for anything from that individual or that person. That which we can capture from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are his words. And so for one who loves Allah, listening to the Holy Quran, reading the Holy Quran is like conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a second tradition from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he mentions that when Zurara was with him, he was paying attention and listening to the Qur'an and he questioned the Imam. He says, he who hears the Qur'an being recited, does he have to listen to it? The sixth holy Imam replies and he says, yes, if the Qur'an is being recited in your presence, it's obligatory upon you to listen to it and pay attention. You and I know that sometimes we have the Qur'an playing in the car, sometimes in our houses. The greatness of this book is such that it should not simply be background sound. It is guidance. It is the speech of the Almighty directly coming to our ears and our hearts. And for that reason, if it is being recited, it is obligatory upon us to ensure that we not speak at the same time, that we not only listen to it, but pay attention to what is being said as well. In the story of Yusuf that we have concluded thus far, we've understood that there were vices within these brothers at the beginning of the surah, at the beginning of the stu- story unfolding within them, manifesting themselves. Vices that would lead them to do something extremely atrocious to their young brother. We then looked at how the relationship between this father Yaqub and his sons were, as well as the relationship that Yusuf had with his father. We then extrapolated from that the rights that a child has over his father, over his parent, and the right that a parent has over their children as well. We come to one of the most astonishing verses in this surah. It's a very eloquent verse and a cliffhanger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves the reader at. Allah continues to say in verse number 15 of Surah Yusuf, فَلَمَّا ذَهَبُوا بِهِ When the brothers took Yusuf and went with him, وَأَجْمَعُوا and they gathered and they came together. They came together and they had plotted this plan. They were ready to put him into the pits of the well. The verse then stops there. It's as if Allah has left the reader 
with his imagination to now contemplate how a seven, eight or nine year old child is going to go into the depths of a well. Is it that they take off his shirt and they throw him inside? Is it they, that they pretend and they're trying to play a game with him and they lure him to go down? Is it that they pick him up in a very aggressive manner and throw him into the pits of this well? Allah in a most eloquent fashion takes the reader right until the well and then stops the sentence there. The verse continues but is not related to Yusuf being thrown inside the well. Allah says, وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِ لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ لَتُنَبِّئَنَّهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِمْ هَذَا وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعَرُونَ that you will, O Yusuf, he reveals to Yusuf. Yusuf is now in the pits of the well. And Allah says, O Yusuf, we are revealing to you that you shall inform them of this event at a time when they are unaware. So from this ilham or from this wahi that Allah has given to Yusuf, this revelation to his heart, it is very clear that Yusuf will survive this trial. Yusuf will survive this calamity being in the pits of the well. Not only will he survive, but there shall be a time when he shall inform his brothers of what they did and they will be unaware that he is, of course, Yusuf. How is it possible that somebody can come to this stage where they're willing to throw a young child into the pits of the well? Interestingly enough, in a verse prior to this, we find that these brothers, or at least some of them, still had a conscience within them. One of them, at least, gave the advice or the opinion that they should kill Yusuf. Another one said, why don't we banish him from the land? But you find in here the reason why they wanted to do it in verse number 9 is that our father may now pay attention to us and after that they still wanted good. They say, وَتَكُونُوا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ قَوْمًا صَالِحِينَ After we commit this action, then we can be of the good individual, of a good people. They wanted to be good individuals. They had a conscience which was telling them that this action that you're about to do is wrong. Not all of them had killed their hearts and their consciences. Maybe some of them, maybe the majority of them, but there were at least some of them that knew that what they were doing was wrong. And then after they've done it, they, they, want, they, they then want to become of the good people. They want to be righteous individuals. From this, we can extrapolate a very important principle. And that is, that the ends does not justify the means. You and I cannot have a good goal and then go about it in a manner which is against the law of the land or against the Sharia. We know that the Sharia dictates to us that we have to obey and uphold the law of the land as well. Of course, so long as it does not contradict our human rights and our Sharia. For that reason, if somebody has a lofty goal, if somebody wants to give charity, it's not possible that that individual then goes about doing fraud in their dealings, in their businesses, goes about earning in a haram fashion, in an unlawful manner, and then goes and gives that charity. These are two contradictory end goals that are coming together. He wants to do good, but the means to do this good deed, the means to do this charity is obviously one that is outside of the Sharia. We find that it is possible that an individual can kill off their desires for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kill off this desire to want to do good. Kill off this desire to go back to Him. Kill off this desire to love Him. If they don't listen to this conscious, if they begin to work against this conscious, when the conscious bites them, and this is a blessing from Allah, that He's given us a conscious that innately tells us what is right and wrong. In a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt alayhi in a beautiful tradition, they say that when you're at a crossroads and you're not aware of what path to choose, then ask your, your hearts for they do not take rishwa, they do not take bribes. Your heart will speak the truth to you, your conscience will tell you what is right. But if you continuously day after day begin to numb this conscience, begin to suffocate this conscience within us, then a time will come when this conscience won't speak anymore, where it's been killed off. And doing evil is like doing good. Sometimes when a youngster especially, especially a youth, when they commit an action, when they lie, when they steal for example, or they do a heinous crime, it bites them, it affects them, and they want to go and repent. They want to repay the individual who they've wronged. But sometimes an adult who continues to do these wrong actions, they come to a stage in their life where lying now becomes habitual, where backbiting becomes the norm, where accusing one another is accepted in society, where not observing physical and social hijab, both for the men and the women, 
is accepted. Have you noticed in our society how there are some vices which are unacceptable but some vices are? For example, in a Muslim community, would it be acceptable for somebody to bring in alcohol and drink within the mosque, in the vicinity of the mosque? It'd be unacceptable, unheard of, not something that would cross anyone's mind. But lying, lying is accepted. Lying takes place. We accept that people lie. In an interesting hadith, we're told that the master key to every sin is drinking alcohol. And then the hadith continues and the Imam says, وَالْكِذْبُ أَشَرُّ مِنَ الشَّرَابِ That lying is even worse off than drinking alcohol. It shows you that in the eyes of Allah, an individual who lies has now opened the doors for every possible sin. They're willing to commit and able to commit now every sin. But on our scale, sometimes lying is much more lighter, is acceptable. These individuals who kill off their conscious, who are now able to do every action without their conscious biting them, without thinking that they're doing wrong, Allah makes mention of them in the Quran and their state. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Afara'ayta man ittakhadha ilahahu hawa. Have you not seen an individual who has taken his base desires as his Lord? Where his desire, his greed, his desire for the opposite gender, his desire of anger, his desire of wealth and greed has overcome this individual. That has become his Lord. That's the reason this individual gets up in the morning. That's the reason this individual goes to work. Have you ever thought when we go to our graves, we're asked sometimes the most simplest questions? Aren't we told that when we go into our graves, we'll be asked, who is your Lord? What is your book? Who is your prophet? Who is your imam? Simple questions that the youngest of children can answer today. Why is it that Allah asks these simple questions? And why is it that it's difficult for many to answer these questions? Because Allah is not asking the mind. Allah will not ask that which we have crammed and memorized. That information will be forgotten. What will remain is what's in our hearts. That law that we worked for. That law that we woke up for. That law that we, where we spent every moment chasing. If we were chasing the dunya, then that will be our Lord. And that's the answer we shall give in the grave. If we were chasing wealth, then that's the answer we shall give in the grave as well. Allah says that He's placed a covering on these individuals' hearts, on their eyes, on their ears. They can't hear anymore. They're not able to take any more guidance. I'd like to remind myself and yourself that these brothers, at least at the beginning of this surah, were running after the dunya. They wanted something from the world that they didn't have and they were willing to go to any length in order to achieve it, including killing their brother or at least contemplating killing their brother. There is a beautiful tradition in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions through the words of the Prophet that Allah has revealed unto the world that run away and tire the one who chases you and serve the one who runs away from you. You will realize that when you run after the world, when you try and obtain only the world, when your goal is simply wealth and luxury, then it always seems like a mirage. The closer you get to where your goal was, the further the goalpost begins to move. But when you begin to run away from this world, meaning when you start to work in this world only for the sake of God, when you work only for the sake of God to bring in a halal income for your family, when you have children for the sake of God, when you get married for the sake of God, to get closer to God, to have a companion on this path, to upbring children onto the path of the Ahlul Bayt. When we work in this manner in the world, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the world, come and serve my servant. Give him from the fruits of the world. We have to remember though, that the world that Allah will give us is not the world necessary that we want. What we want might be different from the world that Allah will give us. Allah will give us that world which is good for us and will take us closer to him. Not the world that will distract us from him and make us deviated from his path. These are the nights of Ramadan, the nights that are passing by us. Every night we recite du'as and ad'iyah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our a'mal, to make us of individuals who are not distracted from this world. Individuals who will pay attention and will fix their gazes upon him. It's in these nights of the holy month of Ramadan where Amir al-Mu'mineen salam would lean on pillars within the mosque of Kufa and whisper in an intimate conversation with his beloved Lord, reminding himself of how much of a slave and a servant he is, how lowly he is, how humble he is, how he is nothing, 
how poor he is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we can contemplate for a few moments every night on the wordings of this great man, the other prayers that we have been prescribed to recite during this holy month, we shall realize that we are poverty in the eyes of Allah. Antumul fuqara Allah, as he says in the Quran. You are nothing. And you depend totally upon Allah. He is the one who's rich. He gives you. As much as you run after the world, he's allotted what there is for you to eat. He has allotted your sustenance. Don't take from somebody else's sustenance. Only take what has been allotted for you. Stay within the boundaries of the Sharia. And then begin to do something greater in this world. What's the main goal of you and I in this world? Why do we live? Do we live to eat and drink and have relations and have children? Or is there something greater that Allah has created us for? Inshallah in these nights we can contemplate on these questions, arrive at greater understandings, so that when the day of Eid comes, we truly return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with cleansed and purified hearts so that He can place true knowledge within it. With that I end and I greet you. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. No, no.